Carrie Carlson, signed Tom Pottern, Secretary of the State, Carrie Dietzik, Chair, Senate Committee on Rules and Administration, and Ann Rest, State Center, District 43. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. President. The Senate will come to order. Members remaining under the order of business and motions and resolutions, Senator Dizik for a motion for designation of special orders. Uh, Mr. President, pursuant to Rule 26, I designate the following bills be made special orders for me immediate consideration, and members the list is on your desk. Members, as so eloquently articulated by Senator Dizik, there is a special orders list on your desk. We will start with uh, General Orders Number 146, House File 2369, uh, a bill on transportation network driver protection. Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I move that the amendment made to HF 2369 by the Committee on Rules and Administration in the report adopted May 20th, 2023, uh, pursuant to Rule 45, be stricken. Senator Fate moved that the amendment made to House File 2369 by the Committee on Rules and Administration in the report adopted May 20, 2023, pers pursuant to Rule 45, be stricken. Any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senator Fate to, to the House File. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the purpose of this bill is to correct a serious problem, uh, an injustice, and an abusive situation that exists towards drivers by TNC companies such as Uber and Lyft. Minnesota has long been a leader in protecting workers from being exploited and taken advantage of. But in the area of TNC drivers, Minnesota is lagging behind other states and cities in providing such protections. So let's start with the compensation. Drivers make less than half of what they did 10 years ago for Uber, as they did as drivers for Uber and Lyft. Their compensation per mile has spiraled downward so far that it is less than any person can deduct on their taxes for using a car for business purposes. Uh, for business purposes, the IRS deduction amount for uh, a business vehicle is 65 cents, while Uber and Lyft pays 61 cents. Um, that means that the current rate doesn't even meet the amount of operating a vehicle. While gas prices uh, were substantially rising, so were the, co the costs of the cars and the repairs, which are all, which are all paid for by the drivers. Uh, nonetheless, Uber and Lyft cut the compensation to the drivers. Uh, the drivers provide the capital for the business. They provide the cars, they're responsible for the repairs, they pay for the maintenance, they buy the fuel and all the costs associated with doing business. Uber and Lyft provides the software that they use throughout the country as well as some advertising. And many drivers work full time as TNC drivers. And often they work more than 40 hours a week to make ends meet. And they work for both Uber and Lyft uh, to make more money and obtain more hours. Uh, but when your compensation is less than half of what it used to be and your costs have dramatically increased, that leaves very little, if any, for the driver. Drivers who typically have very limited income are forced to buy cars that are compliant with the requirements to be an Uber and Lyft driver. Uh, this is a dramatic financial burden for the drivers. However, Uber and Lyft can also deactivate a driver at any time without telling them the reason why, and they do so frequently. Uber and Lyft can also preferentially treat drivers based on any criteria that they wish and do not have any restrictions on retaliations against the drivers. The bill that is before you today addresses some of the abuses that is currently taking place. The bill has removed many of the provisions that addressed other issues that has been streamlined to address the most critical issues that we, need to have, that we need to address right now. Many of the arguments from the TNCs are based off of provisions that are no longer in the bill or are misleading claims. The bill establishes a driver minimum of $1.45 per mile and 25 cents per minute. 
that remains significantly below what they made in 2014 at $1.96 per minute. But it is a fair improvement over what they are currently making. From this, all expenses of safely operating the vehicle have to be paid still by the driver. Uber and Lyft have claimed Minnesota drivers would make more than anywhere else in the country, and that is not true. For example, in Seattle, drivers make $1.50 per mile and 65 cents per minute. That is more than twice as much per minute and a lot more per mile than they will be paid under this bill. Thus, in Seattle and in other cities, uh, higher per minute rates substantially increase the compensation for the driver due to traffic. In out-of-state Washington, in greater Washington area, the drivers make $1.38 per mile. And here, within this bill, folks outside of the seven-county metro will make $1.25 per mile. Once again, less than elsewhere. Uber and Lyft operated successfully in those locations, and although they previously threatened to leave them, they continue to operate their business there. Drivers also receive significant benefits by law that are not given here in Minnesota, such as compensation for serious injury that are not correlated, such as being shot or stabbed, and in some places, unemployment insurance and other similar benefits, and we see that in Washington and Illinois, but not here in, not here in Minnesota. Uh, the fact is that the compensation being proposed here today is well below what Uber and Lyft has previously paid. Again, it used to be $1.96 per minute, and is below what is paid elsewhere in other cities and states. And we think that this is fair, a fair compromise. There is no reason not to provide them what is listed under this bill. Drivers of cabs and other people transporting entities have been regulated by local and state governments for decades, which includes setting minimum wages. Throughout the country, this has been the case. There is nothing particularly new about requiring minimum wages to be paid, which of course is a matter of public safety to make sure that the vehicles have sufficient financing to be safe and that the drivers earn a livable wage. Because again, the drivers are paying for their gas, their car, the maintenance, all of that with the money that they're getting as a wage before they're able to put food on the table for their families. So the next section is deactivation. Currently, drivers can be deactivated without being told why and without, without being given a chance to give their side of the issue. This is despite substantial investment that they've made in being able to perform the job. Amongst the people drivers transport are people who are drunk, sometimes in a bad mood, have biases and prejudice. Uh, and despite years of being successful drivers, a single false claim can deactivate them, and we've seen that frequently. The bill requires Uber and Lyft to tell the driver why the alleged violation is taking place and give them an opportunity to give their side of what occurred. Uber and Lyft will, will provide written rules as to what behavior can lead to deactivation and the right to appeal a deactivation. Uber and Lyft must then decide whether there is sufficient basis to conclude that a rule violation occurred and these decisions are made by Uber and Lyft and the TNCs. These are simple, fair rules to what a company would be using. The bill also allows deactivated drivers since 2021 to have their deactivation reconsidered by the TNC. Now through transparency. The TNCs collect a lot of data about the rides. This is in large part to assure that they correctly charge their customers. This bill allows the drivers to receive that information relevant to their own rides so that they can know the basis of their compensation for their work. All this, all this data is already collected by the, TNC, by the TNCs, so it does not provide an additional, additional burden on them. The last two areas I'm going to talk on are going to be uh, within the collective bargaining employment status. Uh, this portion makes clear that nothing in the statute has any impact on whether their driver is an employee or an independent contractor, nor whether the drivers can collectively bargain. That remains still unaffected by this bill. For driver contract requirements, require, this requires TNCs to notify the drivers of this law. And under the relationship of the parties section, uh, this makes it even clearer that notwithstanding any provision of this law, nothing in this statute affects whether a driver is an independent contractor or an employee. And this may not be used for any future determination or making any such determination. And I'll stop there, Mr. President. Thank you. We are on House File 2369. Uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm wondering if the chief author would just yield for a couple questions. Senator Fate will yield. Uh, Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Fate. So, I, as I was listening to your opening remarks, 
I am a self-employed independent contractor myself, have been for many years. You had made a reference to minimum wage. I'm just wondering, is there uh, other examples of independent contractors having minimum wages set for them by state law? Senator, Luce, uh, excuse me, Senator Fate to the question. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Yes, I believe in the past we've, we've seen that with taxi cab drivers, but we've also seen independent contractors set their own rates, uh, whether they're working independently or as a 1099 for a company, such as uh, electricians, HVAC folks, they set their own per, per hour rates. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I wasn't, okay, I did hear a couple answers in there. If you were to yield for, again for a question. Senator Fateh, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Lucero. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. And again, I'll, I'll ask the same question. For, does Minnesota state law prescribe minimum wages, hourly wages, for independent contractors? Senator Fateh, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. One moment, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Fateh. Yes, for many years, local governments have set minimum wages for taxi drivers throughout the country, including Minnesota, uh, as independent contractors. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Mr. President. And then, uh, I guess I won't ask a question, but just a, a comment. As an independent contractor myself, and as I know many other independent contractors in many different industries, one of the things that we have to ask ourselves is the cost-benefit analysis when making decisions in that particular role. And if, if the conditions are not profitable, then we don't do it. We choose not to enter into that form of uh, labor. And that's our choice. That's the whole word, independent. We can make that choice to do something else. And I think this just sets a, a precedent that is not healthy when there are other options that anybody, these independent contractors, can make choices uh, that are more conducive with whatever it is that they seek, higher wages, benefits, whatever they're looking for, go somewhere else in, in another industry. There are many profitable industries out there if this particular industry is not paying enough. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Westland. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise in support of this bill, and I appreciate the work that Senator Fata has done uh, working with stakeholders um, and trying to come up with a resolution of the problem. You know, uh, there's often a lot of talk about, you know, if you don't like, if you don't like it, go get a different job. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have an interesting uh, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck situation here where people are treated as independent contractors, um, but they really aren't exactly that. We have a situation where we have a company that is taking advantage of um, employees uh, who are characterized as independent contractors, but who really uh, function as, as employees in many respects. At the end of the day, this is about ensuring that Drivers for Uber and Lyft are not subsidizing the service for both the rider and also subsidizing the profits of Uber. Uh, this bill has, uh, has been a good compromise, Mr. President, and this is about fairness. We talk about contracts and reaching contracts, and the fact is that under these situations, you're handed a boilerplate contract. There is no offer and acceptance. There's no negotiation. Um, folks are, are basically told, here's the contract, take it or leave it. These drivers um, are not just students driving for a few extra bucks. Oftentimes, these are people who are driving for their families and trying to make a decent living. And again, it's time that we stop um, uh, subsidizing this service on the backs of the people who are providing it. Thank you. Any other discussion on House File 2369? Seeing none, the Secretary will give the bill its third reading. House File number 2369, a bill for an act relating to labor, establishing protection for transportation network company drivers, et cetera. Third reading. Any other discussion on House File 2369? Senator Muhammad. Thank you, Mr. President. I also rise in support of the bill. 
and want to thank um, Senator Fate for the work that he has done on this bill and to the members in this body who have been working the past few weeks to get it to the shape that it is. Um, but I want to take a moment to acknowledge the community that is in the room who have been here um, in these chambers the last week who have been asking us to, to help protect them. Um, we know that often they do these jobs because for many of them, they're new to this country and this is the only job that they can get and what we're, we're seeing is um, workers across the state show up in the capital, whether it's our nurses or our Uber drivers, um, and say we want to be protected, we want to do this job. Um, I have heard countless stories of how they've been harmed in the job and the company, companies that they work for do not show up for them and they're asking us to show up for them and that's what we're doing today and I'm proud to take this vote. I wanna thank the community for being here. Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. President. I also rise in strong support of this bill and want to thank Senator Fate and all of the people who have contributed to getting this bill to us today. And I am especially pleased to see um, this issue addressed in the bill to dispute um, the ability to create an ability to dispute this deactivation. Uh, we heard testimony in the Senate Labor Committee uh, about these working conditions that people are, are working under and not being able to dispute when they are deactivated. So this is one part of the bill that I'm, I'm very glad is, is in there. I also um, am very pleased to make sure that we will have a floor wage, a base wage that these workers will be able to, to, to receive. And we have heard some people say that this is just a gig job. This is just work that people are doing in addition to other jobs. But that is not the, the testimony that we heard, and I don't think the facts actually reflect that. People working these jobs are working them as their primary source of income, supporting their families, supporting themselves, and this is, this is how they're making their living. This is their career. And so as it is past time that we have a bill that begins to address workers' rights in this area. And so I, I just want to also echo the thanks to the community that came out and testified, shared their stories uh, repeatedly in our different committees, have shown up here at the Capitol to make sure it's crystal clear to all of us who are holding elected office that this is very important to them. It is a priority. It goes to their human rights, their dignity, and their work. And they expect to be supported. They demand to be supported. And I thank them for that. I look forward to supporting this bill today. And members, I ask that you also join us in support. Thank you. Any additional discussions on House File 2369? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. And I want to start off by, you know, thanking TNC drivers. And I've, you know, had the chance to be a, a customer and a rider, and I just really appreciate the work that they do to help Minnesotans get to where they need to go. And I have personally had a really great experience with the drivers here in Minnesota. Um, and I also appreciate in, uh, in the Commerce Committee, I got to hear this bill and the stories that some of these drivers shared around um, you know, the really negative experiences that they have had um, as drivers. Um, but, Mr. President, I, I don't think this bill is the solution. And I am very concerned around what this could mean potentially for rider safety uh, here in the state of Minnesota. Um, one of the concerns I have is if you look at the deactivation section, and I'm looking at uh, line 4.2, it says for a deactivation to be upheld, there must be evidence under the totality of the circumstances to find that it is more likely than not that a rule violation subjecting the driver to deactivation has occurred. Um, and then it continues to say a traffic ticket or other traffic or criminal charge alone is not conclusive of a rule violation unless there has been a conviction. Um, and so, Mr. President, would Senator Fate yield for a question on this uh, section of the bill? Senator Fate, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Rasmussen. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Fate. Senator Fate, my understanding, you know, by reading the more likely than not language is, you know, if a uh, TNC thought that there was a 49% chance that a driver had endangered a passenger or that an assault had occurred or some type of serious rule violation that could lead to a deactivation, under this language, they would be unable to deactivate that, uh, that driver. Am I reading that correctly? Senator Fate, to the question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, the entire determination process uh, from the appeal to the decision making is under the TNC. The TNC's determination is what's going to happen. So if the, if the TNC thinks that more likely than not this happened, then it's going to occur. Um, there's no outside entities at play here. There's, the drivers can't do anything about it. There's no, it's all on the TNC. The, the decision is based um, solely within the TNC. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Fate. And I guess I, I read the language uh, differently. Um, that you know, even here we look in Section Five, we're talking about civil actions that the rider uh, could bring um, as a part of this overall bill. And additionally, here you know we have language that I just read earlier that said even if there's a criminal charge that would violate the rule, that that in and of itself is not conclusive uh, to lead to a long-term deactivation. And I worry, Mr. President and members, the impact that this could have on public safety. And again, I have never had a, I've never had a negative experience uh, with, with TNC um, and being able to you know, work with the drivers here in Minnesota. Um, but I think it's important that we preserve the ability for these companies uh, to keep riders safe. Uh, when they have this type of situation. Um, Mr. President, would Senator Fate yield for another question? Senator Fate will you yield? He will yield. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Senator Fate. Senator Fate, if we had, you know, potentially in a, in a circumstance where we had a victim of a crime, um, I mean, in order to kind of meet this evidentiary standard that's laid out in the bill for deactivation, would that victim necessarily have to provide evidence or would the TNC have to provide evidence uh, to make sure that it meets the evidentiary standard? Senator Fate, to the question. Members, just so that we're clear, it looks like Senator Rasmussen is looking at um, uh, page uh, four, line four, uh, 4.4. 4. Seems where the, the majority of his questions are coming around, or centering around. Thank you, can Senator Rasmussen repeat the question? I apologize. Senator Rasmussen, um, will you repeat the question? Thank you, Mr. President, yes, happy to. Um, so Mr. President, one of the concerns when I'm reading through this language is that there's basically an, an evidentiary standard that's been laid out for deactivation. And so I'm wondering if we had a, a, a rider who's potentially a victim of a crime, would they have to provide testimony or evidence as a part of this process to determine if a deactivation can be upheld? Senator Fate. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, for the deactivation to take place, there would have to be uh, an act um, that would violate the rules within the TNC to occur. Um, there's several ways which a deactivation can occur, but once that deactivation does occur, that's when the right to appeal comes up with the driver. Um, there's, there's, there's more than one way in which a deactivation occurs, just not through uh, a person coming up and saying, I was assaulted. Cinder Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President, and thank you, Senator Fate. And I, I guess, you know, my concern is still there, that we could be requiring victims of a crime um, who maybe don't want to have to provide evidence to provide evidence um, in order for TNCs to keep riders safe. Um, that's a major concern I have with the bill. In addition, I believe there's a two-year look-back provision in this bill where if a TNC has deactivated a driver, perhaps for a very serious violation, that they will now be, have the opportunity to reapply and perhaps the TNC doesn't have the evidence that they need to meet this new standard because two years ago they didn't need to meet this standard to go through a deactivation if they felt it was necessary as a part of their rules or to keep their riders uh, safe. Um, and so, Mr. President and members, this bill has more work to do. And I know we've heard testimony about how this could harm availability of, 
uh, ride-sharing services here in the state of Minnesota. I believe that's true. We've also heard about how this could drive up the cost of uh, ride-sharing here in Minnesota. I believe that is also true. But to me, the most important part of this bill is allowing companies to preserve uh, the safety of their system. And when we have a case where we have a deactivation for a very serious reason, the language in the bill uh, puts a, a burden, a fairly heavy burden on, on the companies, um, and they may not be able to meet that burden and do what they need to do to keep their riders safe. And so, Mr. President and members, I would encourage a no vote on this. I believe this bill needs more work. And for me, it's, it's actually not about the economics. It's about making sure that um, we're keeping people uh, safe. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I stand in opposition of House File 2369. Um, I've done a little research, and to my understanding, this would be the worst bill in the country for drivers, riders, and the companies. The bill will have the most expensive rates here in Minnesota in the country. This bill will make rideshare too expensive for many Minnesotans, eliminating rideshare as a transportation option for most riders. Uh, Mr. President, I wonder if Senator Fateh would uh, stand for a question. Senator Fateh, will you yield? He will yield. Senator Jasinski. Uh, Senator, or thank you, Mr. President. Senator Fateh, do you know what percent of uh, rides uh, start or end in low-income neighborhoods? Senator Fateh. Uh, I do not. I don't have that, but I'm happy to provide you with that information if you'd like. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Jasinski. I've learned never ask a question you don't know the answer to. So from my understanding, 60% of riders start or end in low-income neighborhoods. So this is going to increase the cost for riders in low-income neighborhoods across our state. And folks, many of these people use this for transportation to get to work. So we're going to cost them more money to get to work. Uh, is sounds, sounds ironic to me. 28% uh, of riders identify as members of racial or ethnic minority groups of, of ride shares, so we're affecting them negatively as well because the rates are going to go up. 27% of Minnesota riders use ride share to get to work, as I mentioned before, so we're affecting these riders. The bill will reduce the, reduce the earning opportunities for drivers as ride share will become a luxury in Minnesota for the only the wealthy can afford. The bill will drastically reduce, reduce service in many communities across the state and create transportation deserts across the Trin City metro area. The bill will lead to drivers being classified as employees, and most drivers, from what I understand, oppose this and whether prefer maintaining their independent contractor status. Uh, in my previous life, I was an appraiser and I was an independent contractor. And if I didn't like the rates or I didn't like the fees I was getting, I didn't accept them and I did another job took another job. So uh, I don't think this is a good bill. I hope you vote against it. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. And I rise to stand in uh, support of House File 2369. There are over 40,000 people that come from Oromia. And of those 40,000, a lot of folks want to start in the business of transportation. I'll give you one example. Tashida Tufa, who owns MTN Transportation, it's a large bus company in Minnesota, started off as a cab driver. Started off driving a cab. And when you talk about the ability to, to create something for you and for your future, this does it. And what this also does, Mr. President, is it says the value of government is if I feel listened to, valued, and respected. And this bill gives the drivers that I know that want to be valued, listened to, and respected an opportunity to become the next Tashida Tufa in Minnesota. And with that, members, please vote green. Senator Muhammad. Thank you, uh, Senator President, uh, President Champion. Um, you know, I wanted to get up because um, Senator Jasinski had said something um, along the lines of these uh, rides often start in low communities, of, or communities, um, uh, low income communities, um, which is true. But I think what we're forgetting is the people who are doing these jobs, the drivers, they come from those communities. They make up the bare minimum. And the people who are benefiting, who are making record profits, are these large companies, Uber and Lyft, and our job as the legislators is to protect the folks who 
make the least amount of money, who do the job, the hard job, who are struggling, who are part of our communities. And that's why we're doing this bill. It's not to make it hard for riders. It's not to make it hard for the companies, but it is to protect our workers. And they're here today. Any other uh, questions or discussions on House File 2369? Seeing none, the secretary will, will take the role on final passage of House File 2369. Members, please vote. Senator Roden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. And Senator Murphy votes aye. And Senator Murphy votes aye. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. <clears throat> Mr. President. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Also like to report Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Uh, Senator Young. Mr. President. Senator Rasmussen. I move to excuse all those um, not voting. On that motion. On that motion, all those ha uh, uh, having to. S Senator McEwen. You can't speak once we're voting. All senators having voted, who desire to vote? The secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 32 noes, the bill's passed and, and its title agreed to. <laughs> Members, we will now go to the next bill that's on special orders. That is House File 402, Wicklin, for specifying requirements for healthcare entity transactions and extending the moratorium on, on conversion transactions for certain organizations. Senator Wicklin, to your bill. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yes, this bill, um, House File 402, is a bill that establishes new consumer protections and defines a clear framework for reviewing healthcare mergers and transactions. It builds off of existing nonprofit and antitrust case law, federal regulations, and best practices to solidify a process that will work for Minnesotans. Hospital and other healthcare provider market transactions can have a negative impact on access to affordable healthcare, 
insurance pre premiums, and it is important to have a review process which considers whether a transaction is in the public interest. This bill also recognizes the importance of the University of Minnesota healthcare facilities to the state of Minnesota and all Minnesotans, and um, it, it stresses the importance of these facilities to our state. I'll go through the bill provisions. Um, section one allows for Department of Health to use the all payer claims database to conduct analyses of the impact of healthcare transactions on healthcare costs, market consolidation, and quality. Section two sets out requirements for certain healthcare transactions and establishes a more robust pre-transaction pre notification process. It creates a notification processes, process for transactions under a certain um, over a certain threshold. Um, it states that transactions that substantially lessen competition or tend to create monopoly or monopsony are prohibited. It also puts additional requirements on nonprofit healthcare entity transactions. It lays out in Section 2 um, attorney general enforcement and supplemental authorities, including factors to be considered to inform the attorney general whether a transaction is contrary to the public interest, including such things as whether the transaction would um, harm, um, provide harm to public health, whether it would have a detrimental impact on competing health care options. Uh, whether it would reduce access to affordable and quality care or have a negative impact on medical education and teaching programs or medical research. And also, the, it, uh, the process can consider whether the uh, transaction will increase health care costs for patients. Section 3 sets up a process for um, reporting data, and actually I'll, I'll skip over that for now. I have an amendment to add this section. Um, the next section relates to the ownership or control of the University of Minnesota healthcare facilities, and it states that because they are public, publicly supported academic healthcare facilities and they're important to um, assets to the state, that they, may, they must remain dedicated to the university's public health care mission. It states that the U of M healthcare facility shall not be owned or controlled directly or indirectly, in whole or in part, by a for-profit entity or an out-of-state entity, unless the Attorney General determines that ownership or control by such entities um, is in the public interest. This determination must be made by the process laid out in Section 2. Um, the, the next section relates to a current moratorium that is, is in place on conversion transactions, and it, it extends that moratorium from July 1st of 20. Uh, 23 to um, July 1st of 2026. The last section provides for a study and recommendations by the Department of Health on regulations for um, conversions, mergers, transfers of assets, and other transactions affecting Minnesota domiciled nonprofit health maintenance organizations and for profit health maintenance organizations. Um, this will allow us to take time to examine um, having the moratorium in place longer will allow us to have time to, um, to have this study take place and learn more about what, what we should put in place for regulations. Um, and before I go further, I would like to offer the A14 amendment. Senator Wickland offers the A14 amendment. The secretary will report the A14 amendment. Senator Wickland moves to amend House File Number 402, the second unofficial engrossment, as follows. Page 2, line 28, delete section and insert chapter. This is the A14 amendment. Senator Wickland, to your A14 amendment. Uh, members, this, this men, amendment has been developed um, through work with a large number of stakeholders. The bill actually has, has changed over the course of session. Uh, but we still had some areas of concern that uh, some healthcare provider entities had brought forward. And so this amendment, it makes changes to um, the threshold for um, the need to submit um, the transaction for the review process from $40 million to $80 million. Um, it also changes the timeline for, um, for the notice requirement from 90 days to 60 days. Um, and uh, because we would like to learn more about healthcare transactions that are taking place in the state, it establishes a data reporting uh, section 
that um, will be in place for transactions where the the healthcare entity involved in the transaction has average revenue between $10 million and $80 million per year, or the transaction will result in an entity projected to have an average revenue between $10 million per year and $80 million per year once the entity is operating at full capacity. Um, it lays out a number of um, data um, items that the healthcare entity must provide. And these are meant to help us understand transactions going on in the state, but not, um, not, will not be overly burdensome to these entities. And uh, it says that the commissioner of uh, the Department of Health shall use the data collected under this section to analyze the number of healthcare transactions in, in Minnesota and the potential impact these transactions will have, uh, may have on equitable access to or the cost and quality of healthcare services um, and develop recommendations for the legislature on improvements to the law. Um, this also uh, puts, lays out um, more clarification of the naming of the University of Health, uh, Minnesota Healthcare Facilities um, so that it is um, clearer which facilities we are specifically talking about and that goes in the section relating to the University of Minnesota. And that, um, that members, that is the A14 amendment, and I would appreciate your support. Any other discussion on House File 402? Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. And I've kind of followed this project along. It keeps morphing into different forms. But, um, you know, just on the grand, uh, this amendment, um, and I'll just, I guess, off my comments in the bill later. Um, but to the whole bill, which is a bill, which this amendment is improving a little bit, you could ask the question, why are we even having this bill? Um, what business is it um, of the Attorney General to micromanage some of these transactions? And you can argue there's a public good uh, that we want to make sure there's no consolidation. And I, for one, don't favor a lot of consolidation. Uh, I, I don't think the consolidation has helped. Uh, this is uh, confounded by the whole Sanford Fairview merger. Um, but Mr. Uh, member, Mr. President and members, if you think the bill is too onerous in its present form, this bill makes it better. This is the sum of negotiations with some of the people that are extremely concerned about it. So at least if you want to help them have less um, interference in their business, this is a good amendment for that purpose. I would urge members to vote green. Uh, we're on the A14 amendment. Uh, uh, Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just ask for a roll call vote, please. Roll call request a roll call granted. Any other discussion on the A14 amendment? Seeing none, the secretary would take the roll on the A14 amendment. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. And Senator Murphy votes aye. Senator Murphy votes aye. Any other votes under Rule 40.7? When you're ready, Senator Jasinski. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Senator Lang votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. All senators having voted who desires a vote, the secretary will close the roll. There have been 56 ayes and zero noes. The A14 amendment is adopted. <laughs> Members, we are now on uh, we're still on the House file, which is House file 402. 
The second, did you want to speak now on third reading? No. Uh, uh, Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. President. I would move to re-refer House File 402 to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. Senator, uh, uh, the Secretary of State will report. Secretary of State. Sec <laughs> I knew that you guys were listening. I just wanted to make sure that you were listening. I'm going to restate the motion. Give us one moment. Senator Rasmussen moves that House File 402 be re-referred to the Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. Senator Rasmussen, to your motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this bill has not gone to the Commerce Committee, and I understand it has made a, a couple committee stops, or the Senate version has made some committee stops. Um, this is also relating to commerce. We're talking about transactions. We're talking about what would be prohibited, what would not be prohibited. Um, the this bill in the other body went to the Commerce Committee. That's actually where it started. And so I think it's worthy having a discussion and debate. And I think as evidenced by the A14 amendment that was adopted, um, there are some questions that need to be answered on this bill. And one of the concerns that I have is we're writing general legislation to really address one transaction. Um, and I think we need to make sure that we understand the consequences that this could have for other healthcare companies, um, and I think the Commerce Committee would be a great place to continue that conversation, Mr. President. I would encourage uh, that members support this motion. Senator Kupik. Thank you, Mr. President. I would just request a roll call on this. Roll call requested, roll call granted. Senator Wicklin. Uh, members, I would oppose the motion to re-refer to, to the Commerce Committee. Um, this bill was heard in the Health and Human Services Committee where we talked about um, the issues having to do with health care entities. Um, it was heard in the State and Local Government Com Committee um, having to the jurisdiction over the Attorney General's office and uh, processes that the Attorney General uses. And it was heard in the Judici Judiciary Committee uh, where we examined um, other things related to the Attorney General's office and um, the uh, use of data collected uh, amongst other topics. So I, I do not believe that it needs to go to the Commerce Committee and we should um, reject this motion. Senator Uckey. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would ask members to support Senator Rasmussen's motion to refer this to Commerce. This bill, as it sits, is a direct hit on a merger that's been talked about here quite a bit in the last number of months. But when you look further, it won't just affect this one merger, transaction, whatever you want to call it, but it will be in place for everybody else down the road. When we get into those type of, this type of legislation that is going to affect those type of uh, operations, purchases, mergers, et cetera, this needs to be discussed in commerce. That's where they talk about this, the transactions and how it affects us. So with that, Mr. President and members, please support Senator Rasmussen's motion. Last person to, uh, before we vote is the author of the uh, motion to re-refer, Senator Rasmussen, and then we will vote. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, and I do really enjoy... All right. Uh, serving on the Commerce Committee, and I oftentimes will joke that anything interesting has to make a stop at the Commerce Committee, and this bill has not. Um, I think it's an important one that uh, is going to shape how the healthcare industry will operate in the state of Minnesota, and oftentimes we'll see many bills that relate to the business side of healthcare will make a stop both in the Commerce Committee and in uh, Chair Wicklund's Health Committee. I think this bill uh, should be no different. There's obviously some complicated factors out here, and I just think it's important for this body to do its work fully and not be rushing through a bill like this. So I would encourage members uh, to support the motion. The Secretary would take the roll on the motion to re-refer. There was a, a roll call requested, and a roll call was granted. Men members, please vote. For those voted pursuant to Rule 40.7, Senator Bowden. 
Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Herr votes no. Senator Herr votes no. Senator Mann votes no. Senator Mann votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Port votes no. Senator Pa votes no. Senator Pa votes no. Senator Morrison votes no. Senator Morrison votes no. Senator Murphy votes no. Senator Murphy votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. And Senator Fate votes no. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Coleman votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Senator Duckworth votes aye. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lang votes aye. And Senator Lang votes aye. All senators having voted who desire to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 33 ayes and 34 noes, the motion to re-refer does not prevail. <laughs> Members, we are on the underlining bill. The secretary will give the bill its third reading. House File 402, a bill for an act relating to health establishing requirements for certain health care entity transactions, etc. Third reading. Any other discussion? Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President, and I'm glad that amendment went on. At least the bill is now a little more workable and will be far less punitive to the people who are just trying to do normal business. Uh, as the bill came out, it was really uh, far too broad, and it's a little narrower. And I'm, there, there's a good thing about the bill. I like the fact that it makes a strong view that the U is uh, really an important entity to Minnesota and should be protected. Um, and you can argue about does it need protection from out-of-state interests or not, um, and uh, in-state uh, other interests, and the bill clarifies some of that in it. But I'm, one thing I like about the bill is that it says that the U is important and we want to protect its integrity. I'm a little concerned about the heaviness of some of the merger proposals, but I, I have a question. So if Senator Wicklin would, would please yield. Senator Wicklin, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Abler. Well, Senator Wickland, uh, I, I, we talked about this bill in committee, the, the one it went to. Too bad it couldn't go to Commerce, but I guess that's okay. For now, it's getting kind of late in the year anyway, and they're pretty busy in Commerce. Anyway, so, um, so Senator Wickland, um, uh, would, uh, let's say the Mayo Clinic wants to take the place of Sanford in this merger discussion. And um, what would that look like under this bill? 
Senator uh, Wicklin, to the question. If the entity, um, they would have to follow the same process as would any other um, entity. It isn't restricting the examination of transactions to only out-of-state entities. It's, it, so it would be proceeding the same. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. And so, Senator Wicklin, there's, let's just say there's two projects on the table, the Mayo Clinic wanting to merge with Fairview, say, and then Sanford wanting to merge with Fairview. Could you give me an idea about the time frame that, that the Mayo project would take and the time frame that the Sanford project would take, if, if she would yield, Mr. President? Senator, uh, Senator Wicklin, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Wicklin, to the question, did you hear it? Um, yes, Mr. President, I heard the question. I do not know um, how long either one of those processes would take. I would have to have more information, or would have to consult with the Attorney General's office. Senator Abler. Well, thank you. Mr. If Senator Wickland would yield again, so I'm just curious. Um, let's pretend that, well, let's pretend that the Mayo Clinic is going to just decide to do it before this bill passes and then after the bill passes. Senator Wicklin, could you give me an aide of the time frame uh, and the burden on the Mayo Clinic? Oh, if she would yield, Mr. President. Senator Wicklin, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Abler. I got the hand signal, Mr. President. Thank, Thank you. you. I, you'd think I'd get that figured out by now. I've been here long enough <laughs> to know I was wondering better. if you could really see my hand gestures without having your glasses on. Oh, that's funny, Mr. President. <laughs> Senator hey, Blur. People live in glasses houses should not throw stones, <laughs> Mr. President. So um, anyway, so Senator Wickland, compared to with this bill and like current law, both current law and now the bill passes, uh, the Mayo Clinic says we want to be a player up in the metro area. We want to take care of the Fairview uh, thing because it's actually at some point, Mr. President, Fairview is going to have to be rescued. Uh, it's a big deal. We need somebody to do Fairview's job. So Mayo says, we're going to come do this. And they decide to do it like in the next week before this becomes effective. And now they, or they wait till next year when the law is effective. So the question is, how much longer will it take and how more burdensome will it be to the merging entity after the bill is done compared to before? Senator Wicklin, to the question. Mr. President, uh, the process is meant to provide the Attorney General with um, the information that it would need to evaluate the transaction, that collect the information from the entities, and um, be able to put together um, their analysis. And I don't have the information on how long it would take now versus then. Currently, the Attorney General does not have the capabilities to um, analyze and assess transaction, healthcare transactions, and that is why we are bringing the bill forward. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Some of the other questions we dealt with in the committee when we heard it, um, and one of the objections of the bill, which maybe the amendment fixed, was the look back time was indefinite. And so that would be one of the answers. The answer might be there could never be going forward because they would cancel it. So Senator Wicklin would yield for another question, Mr. President. Senator Wicklin, will you yield? She will yield. Senator Abler. Well, thank you, Senator Wicklin. Under the amended version of the bill, how long can the Attorney General look back and decide he wants to try to, if he decides something's not in the public interest, how long can he go back and, and cancel it? Senator Wicklin, to the question. Mr. President, Senator Abler, the, the amendment does not change the language of the underlying bill. Senator uh, Abler. Okay, well, Mr. President, if you yield again, I'm almost done. I just, this, this bill has been interesting, but challenging for a lot of us. So. Uh, Senator Wicklin, will you yield? She will yield, Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Senator Wicklin, what is the look back? How, how long can the Attorney General go after an after transaction got consummated, if that's or closed or whatever, uh, and still cancel it based upon his view that, oh no, I, now I decided it's not in the public interest? Senator Wicklin is confirmed, and she will, will answer the question when she's ready, uh, Senator Abler. So just give us a moment. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Wicklin. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, it does not have a, uh, an ending um, a time frame, um, but um, if the Attorney General wished to um, unwind a transaction, it would have to be done only if the, there was a public interest 
um, reason for doing so. This isn't an arbitrary process that the Attorney General can just go in and unwind a transaction uh, without any um, also other uh, evidence that it is in the contrary to the public interest. And, uh, so it, and it would have to go to court to do so um, and prove to in a court that it uh, was not in the public interest and needed to be um, enjoined or unwound. Senator Abler. Thank you, Mr. President. I won't ask any more questions, but um, Mr. President, I really like the part about protecting the U. I'm concerned about the open-ended discussions. And by the way, two of the three sites that, that says the U has, they haven't owned for a good long time. In fact, one of them Fairview built, I'm told. So, um, Mr. President, perhaps given the tax bill we just passed and the challenges the economy is going to be facing, I think a person would consider if you want to boost the economy, particularly for lawyers, there's going to be a lot of activity here that could be brought forward uh, as, uh, as transactions are questioned and then litigated. And so I wish this bill could have been a little better. I'm still deciding how I'm going to vote on it. I'd like, I really like the you part, uh, but I just want to be on record as saying um, I think we're going to be re revisiting this, and I think when we want to queue up work for next year, this should be top of the list for the Commerce Committee. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Wicklund, as the last person before we vote, Senator Wicklund. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would urge members to support the bill. It is one that will put in place uh, a process for Minnesota to begin to understand how many and what type of trans what kind of transactions are occurring, and for significant tra um, transactions over uh, uh, the eighty million dollar level, it does give the attorney general more specific tools to be able to investigate these transactions and take action if it is determined that they are not in the public interest. And lastly, it gives us a way to protect assets that are important to the state of Minnesota that are part of the University of Minnesota um, healthcare facilities. So I would um, ask for your support and vote green. Thank you. The secretary will take the roll on final passage of House File 402 as amended. <laughs> Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. Senator Morrison votes aye. And Senator Fate votes aye. And Senator Fate votes aye. Members, take a look at your votes. Senator Jasinski, when you're ready, for those members voting under Rule 40.7, Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lang votes no. And Senator Lang votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 35 ayes and 32 noes, the bill is passed and its title agreed to. <laughs> Senator Dizek. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, I've been told that the other body just passed the transportation bill, so it should be here shortly. So I don't believe we'll recess, but just ask that you stay in, you know, in and around the chamber. Thank you. Senator, uh, uh, Senator Diesick did not do a motion. She just asked that we hang out for a minute because the other body is sending over the other bill, which I believe is the transportation bill. So now's a good time for you to talk to each other. 
I will return shortly.
Members remaining under order of business of motions and resolutions, we will resort to the third order of business. Uh, we will now just go to Senator Dibble. Oh, oh, do I still need to have you? Okay. Uh, the secretary will read the message from the House. Mr. President, I have the honor to announce that the House has adopted the recommendation and report of the Conference Committee on House File Number 2887 and repass said bill in accordance with the report of the committee, so adopted. House File Number 2887, a bill for an act relating to transportation, establishing a budget for transportation. House File Number 2887 is herewith transmitted to the Senate. Signed, Patrick D. Murphy, Chief Clerk, House of Representatives. Senator Dibble, for motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, I move that the foregoing recommendations and conference committee report on House File Number 2887 be now adopted and the bill be repassed as amended by the conference committee. Members, Senator Dibble moves that. Senator Dibble moves that the foregoing recommendations and conference committee report on House File 2887 be now adopted and that the bill be repassed as amended by the conference committee. Senator Dibble, to that uh, motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I would like to request a roll call on that motion. Roll call, request a roll call granted. Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, members, uh, this is the transportation bill, Senate uh, House File 2887, uh, passed out a conference committee last night. Uh, and let me just start by thanking uh, my co-leader, uh, Senator Jasinski, uh, and all of my conference committee members. I'll get to uh, thank yous uh, towards the uh, end of the, of the bill, but I do want to just thank everyone for uh, working so hard uh, late into the night uh, to bring this bill to us here today so we can discuss and debate it and hopefully pass it, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, transportation is so fundamental to every aspect of our lives, to the success of our economy, our communities, our families, our our prosperity, of our individual selves, uh, and of course, uh, the wider economy is so, so uh, dependent on whether or not we invest and make those key investments in transportation that we haven't done for so long. Transportation done well, make sure everybody has access to destinations important in their lives. It can benefit our environment, and it can do so much more, or not done well, it can do the opposite, it can isolate people, can harm our environment, and it can harm our economy. Mr. President, members, there is no surplus in transportation in Minnesota. The sources and resources that we rely on to support transportation are outside of the general fund, and they're stagnant or in their in decline. They're losing revenue, they're losing ground to inflation, they're losing ground to the fact that we haven't been making these investments in all of the repair needs that go lacking and wanting become more and more expensive. And the circumstance for transit, particularly in the metropolitan area, Mr. President, is even worse. With zero effort to support transit in the metro area uh, on a long-term sustained basis with just one-off funding and zero general fund targets, we're facing a fiscal cliff in just a couple of years, which means we would actually effectively dismantle much of our regular route service. We certainly wouldn't keep up with the growing demand and growing population that we expect uh, in the metropolitan area. So Mr. President, I'm excited to present this bill today. It is a, a real opportunity, it's generational in nature, in which we can at long last stop limping along with one-off, one-time funding or borrowing to the hilt and get on the path of sustained, reliable funding so we won't have the dystopia of potholes everywhere or wrecking everyone's cars. We won't have the uh, unending clamor of special legislation looking for community requests or earmarks, as some call them, uh, because projects will be funded. And we won't see transit service actually being cut and people totally isolated. Mr. President, Investments in transportation actually have a return on the dollar. All reliable economic research shows investments in transit return $3 for every dollar we put in. Transit is even better with $5 returning from every dollar we put in. And when we get busy building roads, fixing roads, fill, building transit and the like, we can actually create 13,000 jobs or more per year with this bill. 
ongoing, just the construction jobs alone. So, uh, Mr. President, just very quickly to a few elements of this bill. Um, it raises uh, some additional resources. Uh, the gas tax uh, is, is indexed to inflation, so finally we won't have to worry about its loss in revenue relative to inflation. We've lost so much buying power from the gas tax relative to inflation and fuel efficiency and the like um, that the gas tax only purchases a tiny fraction of what it used to. 30 years ago, we gave it a small little bump uh, uh, about 10 plus years ago, but even that has lost its ground to inflation. So there's a little bit of indexing to put some money into our high user tax distribution fund, um, as well from the license tab fees, a small increase in uh, what we pay on the rate, as well as slowing down the depreciation schedule, as well as uh, bringing the motor vehicle sales tax up to the level that regular sales tax in, that's a small increment. Uh, much of that goes to support Greater Minnesota Transit. Those are the three constitutionally dedicated sources, Mr. President. And then we have um, the, what, we call, what some know as the delivery fee, we, we're calling the road maintenance fee. Um, and that's a, a 50 cent fee that folks would pay if they purchased $100 or more of non-exempt goods. Uh, the exempt goods would be anything related, pertaining to food, including restaurants and uh, uh, essential goods like medicines and, and other sorts of essential uh, goods. And Mr. President, if folks uh, you know, order $100, $300, $3,000 worth of those goods, they wouldn't pay the, the road maintenance fee um, if they don't also include $100 of the non-excluded items in that order. Uh, and then, uh, Mr. President, we uh, support our, our transit in the metropolitan area with a, a, a metropolitan-wide sales tax, uh, which is the first time we've done that uh, on a metropolitan-wide basis, Mr. President. That is what every other metropolitan area in this country does. They actually uh, have usually a penny or more uh, to support transit. Uh, Mr. President, this will, for the first time, uh, on a sustained, ongoing basis, uh, and not on you know, a county-by-county county or you know, one-off basis, uh, have the, the sustained, ongoing support since well before uh, a lot of us were here in this chamber when we paid for transit on the property tax. We eliminated that in 2000, uh, and we haven't really had any sort of reliable ongoing source uh, for transit that really supports our transit system uh, since that time. So that is uh, extremely exciting and a major achievement. And there's a number of initiatives, uh, Mr. President, in this bill um, that make sure that we're serving everyone in Minnesota, not just some communities and not just some areas of Minnesota. Uh, and we're making sure we take care of, of our environment. I'm excited that state roads and bridges will be supported, proud of the work that uh, Senator Dzinski has done to keep a focus on corridors of commerce and making sure there's uh, statewide uh, parity on that. Our county highways, both our county roads that are off the CASA system as well as the CASA uh, fund itself uh, will be significantly bolstered. Municipal state aid streets as well as larger city streets that are not on the MSA system supported very strongly. That these local improvements are taking pressure off the property tax as well. Small cities, for the first time ever, a sustained, ongoing source of funding. They've never had that. They get no money from the gas tax. They rely on occasional appropriations we make to the local road improvement program. And uh, it's just been uh, really, really difficult for our small cities across the state to receive that reliable source of funding. Um, now they're on that path, and, uh, and we've set up a fund with a statutory appropriation, and that will be ongoing and, uh, and supporting those local communities. Townships as well. Uh, and Mr. President, 80% or more of our roadway miles are, are run by local units of government, whether that's townships, small cities, large cities, counties, uh, and the state partnership has been really, really weak and tenuous. Very, very proud that we have a strong support for Greater Minnesota Transit. In fact, are pretty much fulfilling all of what they need uh, to have those strong systems that get people where they need to go in all kinds of communities, whether it's regional centers, small towns, deep rural. Greater Minnesota Transit has many different permutations, looks differently in all parts of the state, and we're getting the funds both for their capital and their operating needs, as well as some one-time money uh, to support uh, what they need for the local match, as well as some IHA dollars that'll come in and support uh, those systems. We support active transportation uh, with some significant one-time dollars, as well as for the first time, uh, we have a, a base level of funding ongoing. Uh, and this is highly subscribed and in demand in every community across our state. Um, we have people 
who want to have ways to move throughout their community, whether they're going to school or whether they're going to downtown to shop or just moving around their community on bike or on foot. Active transportation and safe routes to school is strongly supported, and that's a gener generational advance. Uh, electric vehicles, a lot of people are nervous about buying an electric vehicle because they might go on a trip and get stranded. Uh, we're going to put uh, electric charging stations throughout uh, the state. A lot of that is matching federal dollars that are coming in for that purpose, and we're going to match those dollars and make that happen. Um, some of the environmental initiatives, highways for habitat, uh, living snow fences, uh, and taking a look at how our transportation system uh, has an effect of and, and inter interacts with uh, greenhouse gas emissions. We know that transportation is the second largest contributor to greenhouse gas emissions to our climate change, our existential crisis, and uh, we need to figure out a way to turn that around. Did I say second? It's the largest contributor. It used to be the second largest, now it's the largest contributor, uh, and the trends are moving in the wrong direction. Very proud that we're going to fully fund uh, the Northern Lights Express inner passenger rail, inner city passenger rail um, from the Twin Cities up to Duluth, uh, and um, we're going to take care of our deputy registrars and driver's license agents with some additional resources that they need. Um, they've been underfunded for a long time. Um, they're the ones who are, are available out in our communities for driver's license transactions, for motor vehicle transactions. Um, we have a new system, it's really slick, it works really well, but it creates a lot of more work at the window, it takes more time, and they have more responsibility uh, on them. And so increasing filing fees, some one-time funds, as well as a convenience fee that they can collect at the window will support our, our deputy registrars. A lot of smaller provisions, I won't get into all of it, but you know, Senator Westrom has a provision that uh, helps those with disabilities or who are elderly, uh, who rely on young relatives to get around for what they need. They'll have a driver's license expansion that's available for, for them. Farm workers um, who don't live on the farm but live near the farm, uh, who are uh, younger than 16, will have access to a driver's license so they can drive around the community and fulfill the responsibilities of their job. Um, uh, we have, oh my gosh, specialty plates <laughs> in the bill for uh, missing and murdered indigenous relatives and sports teams and the Lions clubs. Um, and I'm not a big fan of those, but I'm a big fan of compromise and negotiation, and so we brought those into the bill. Um, with that, uh, Mr. President, uh, it's a big bill, a lot to talk about. I won't get into all the details, but I'll respond to questions, and I know some other of my members have some elements that they'd like to present. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator McEwen. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Members, I rise in enthusiastic support of um, this bill. And I want to thank uh, Chair Dibble for uh, his commitment to a truly um, comprehensive vision of transportation for our state. Uh, when I joined the Transportation Committee a couple of years ago, I had some excellent conversations with Chair Dibble about transportation, and we talked about being transportation nerds in our committee and, and what that means. And we've also um, talked about the importance of having a more holistic vision of what transportation is, what it means. Um, it is roads and bridges. Absolutely it is, and those are absolutely um, very important components to maintain, to develop, to keep in, in good shape, and, um, and to modernize. But transportation at its heart is about the movement of people and goods. It's about connection. It's about how we get from one place to another, how we visit our friends and family, how we get to work and back, how we move about in our community, travel around our state. And so it shouldn't be limited to just roads and bridges. It should also be expanded to include things like rail, things like quality public transit that is reliable, that is clean, that is well-maintained, that is safe. And um, so I appreciate so much Chair Dibble's commitment to that holistic vision of what transportation can and should be for the people of our state. And I truly believe that this bill is um, truly in service to that holistic vision. So I can't thank Chair Dibble enough. I also am, am thankful to our whole committee, which it was a pleasure to be on this committee and to work um, with all of the members on the committee on all the transportation bills that we heard. 
I'm just going to point out a couple of things that I am very excited about, of course. I am thrilled to see this full funding for the Northern Lights Express. And the people of my district in Duluth and in northeastern Minnesota are so excited to have this option available um, to travel along that corridor. This is going to open up so many connection opportunities for people going back and forth between northeastern Minnesota and Duluth and all along the route to the Twin Cities and back. Um, in particular, uh, one of the issues that we've heard and I think is uh, hopefully one that is going to be improved with the Northern Lights Express is that we have a no number of veterans up north in northeastern Minnesota who uh, are not able to drive or it's too much for them to have to drive down to the VA when they need to go down to the VA in Minneapolis. But they will be able to hop on the Northern Lights Express to get on in Duluth to come down to receive the services at the VA that they need to receive. So this will, will provide that other option for them, that choice, and uh, hopefully make that trip a little bit easier. Um, so just so excited to see this full funding and this investment in rail, both the Northern Lights Express and also just in rail in general in our state, um, really shoring up um, the services, again, to make them dependable, to make them um, timely, uh, easy to use, and a meaningful op option for people to be able to choose and how they move around the state. I'm also thankful that uh, my bill to create uh, reintegration driver's license licenses was included in this omnibus bill. This is a, a temporary license that can be issued free of charge for people who are exiting incarceration in Minnesota. It allows them to be able to uh, meet the um, requirements of their of their parole um, after they exit. They have requirements oftentimes where uh, they're required to seek employment, they need to go see a parole officer, they need to perhaps attend treatment or meet these different benchmarks that they have to meet. And um, it's unfortunate that for some of them not having a driver's license or having had their driver's license revoked during the time that they were incarcerated, uh, when they exit, to not have it is a huge barrier. And of course, we want them to be successful when they exit and, and re-enter into the community. So this is a, a great step to improve that, um, that success rate. So for this and many other reasons uh, that I am just, I'm just thrilled to, to stand in support of the bill. And uh, I may have a little bit more to say later after the third reading, but I, I appreciate very much um, this omnibus and I hope that we can all get behind it and support it. Thank you. Senator Morrison. Thank you, Mr. President. Members, this is a transformative transportation package. It's been such an honor to serve on this committee. I want to thank Chair Dibble for his leadership and all the members of our committee, including Ranking Member Jasinski. And I especially want to thank all DFL and GOP and nonpartisan staff, just such an impressive and talented staff um, and a pretty well-functioning committee, I, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> I'll be very brief, but I am so proud of this package that will provide long overdue investments in our transportation system, the systems that connect us to each other, to our work, to healthcare, and to the things that define a mobile and fulfilled life. This is truly a transformative bill that will have positive impacts on our entire state by fixing our roads, improving transit, rail, microtransit, active transportation, and safety, among other things, all while taking climate into account. I urge all members to support this bill. Thank you. Senator Carlson. Thank you, Mr. President. Indeed, this is a transformative bill. As uh, Senator Dibble said, we don't have a surplus in transportation. We actually still have a lot of needs that need to be met. And this bill does a, goes a long way in beginning to match some of those needs uh, across the state. We still have a lot of bridges that need uh, replacement or repairs. We still have a lot of roadways that have 
uh, significant problems with them or even overcrowding. And this bill is the best that I've seen as far as trying to uh, catch up with some of the, um, the funding that we have uh, sort of left go. Uh, the, our system is in very great need. And I want to especially uh, thank Senator Dibble for including some of the road safety issues that uh, we have been looking at for quite some time. One of them is the uh, um, just reporting crashes with fatalities more quickly. Uh, other is establishment of safe road zones. Another is the, the ability to take driver's training online. Uh, we do have a lot of people that have to take driver's training now that we need to to uh, supply licenses, and we want those people, people to be able to take their uh, training online. But one of the things that I made, mainly was involved in is a, an issue of the move over rule, so that we can get people to move over when there's a disabled vehicle on the side. And I want to thank uh, the uh, uh, president of the Safety Council, Mr. Paul Asson, for helping us get that that language uh, agreed to between the um, AAR, sorry, the uh, AAA, uh, the uh, State Patrol, and all the people that were involved in this, including uh, Senator Drazkowski, who wanted to include that, uh, include postal workers in the same uh, language. So we have a lot of safety things that we're doing here, uh, and I think we still have more to do in the, in the future. But uh, this is a, a transformative bill that is going to get us a long way ahead in getting, catching up with some of our things. And I'm hoping that we even get some money to maybe fix Cedar Street outside. So I'm really happy to be part of this, be part of the conference committee. And thank you, Mr. President, for the few minutes. Senator Kupik. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to focus on one small part of this bill, which is a rail safety element. Uh, this was a bill that I had carried through. Uh, the Federal Department of Transportation says that we average 1,475 train derailments uh, between 2005 and, two, and 2021 in the U.S., and the Federal Railroad Administration said that Minnesota had 344 derailments over the last 10 years. In my district, a uh, major east-west rail line has 60 to 70 trains a day, pass right through the downtown cores of Moorhead, Detroit Lakes, Glendon, Hawley, Lake Park, Audubon. Adjacent to the downtown of Dilworth is a major rail yard. Uh, should something go wrong in one of these heavily populated areas, having the proper information of how to respond and in a timely manner and with communication with railroad officials could be the difference between an accident and a disaster. The safety bill included here in the transportation bill will make sure our first responders and emergency managers have the knowledge they need in how to respond to an accident. Working with railroads and emergency managers and the Pollution Control Agency, uh, we were able to create a bill that not only is manageable for all parties, but will improve safety in communities across Minnesota by making tabletop and full-scale disaster exercises available to communities all across the state. I want to thank Senator Dietzik, who originally brought this bill forward, and to Senator Dibble for including it in the Conference Committee Transportation Bill, and I urge a green vote on this. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I want to thank Senator Dibble uh, for being very respectful in the Transportation Committee. We've had a good relationship over the last six years, now going on seven years. Uh, we've always worked together. We don't agree on everything. Uh, but I think Senator Dibble sets an example of how a committee should operate and how a conference committee should operate. So I want to thank him. Uh, again, we don't always agree, but we understand the both of us what compromise can do and how that benefits Minnesota. I also want to thank Representative Hornstein, who we've also worked with over the years very well. Uh, he's been a phenomenal person to work with across the aisle, and I also have uh, much respect for him, as well as Representative Petersburg and Representative Torkelson, who always seems to come out, somehow get in the conversation. Uh, we've worked well over the years, and we, I think we've compromised on things, on a lot of things to make things better. I want to thank our staff, uh, my staff, Senator, uh, not Senator, uh, Dave Frazier, uh, he might be a senator someday, but Dave Frazier, uh, Dom Linetti, uh, Beth Ethier, Alex Will, 
And then, of course, our nonpartisan Krista Boyd, uh, Tim Greenfield, and we can't forget Lexi Stangle, who started off with us and, and got advanced, uh, but she did a lot of work in, in many years. So, uh, everything I'm going to say bad about the bill is going to be no uh, surprise to Senator Dibble. I've been very vocal on things I don't like, uh, but there are things I do like. So, uh, I'm going to go through a few of them. Uh, I believe a $3.77 billion in increased taxes is too much for Minnesotans right now. Uh, we're, we're seeing increase in almost every committee. We do have a $19 billion surplus, that is correct. Transportation does need money, but it's about priorities. Prior to now, we've only used about one half of 1% 1 of the general fund towards transportation. Uh, in 2017, 2018, uh, Republicans uh, took and captured an existing tax of auto parts sales tax, only a portion, and we could have used more of that uh, to increase funding for a lot of the things that are good in this bill. Um, but we did not. We did that in fee increases. We've seen fee increases in motor vehicle sales tax, tab fee increases, uh, increase in depreciation or how, how long it gets depreciated more up front so it will be more expensive to have your car for the first five years. Uh, we're seeing a delivery fee, which I think is confusing to a lot of people. It's going to cause a lot of small businesses and other people uh, to try and figure that out. Uh, and many of our businesses are small, and they don't, aren't here on a day-to-day -day basis to understand all the changes that are being made. Uh, we're seeing a gas tax increase. It's going to be about five, five cents over the next four years, and then it'll compound after that. So I'm concerned about that. Again, capturing auto parts sales tax was our plan. Uh, and looking at some of the electrical vehicle surcharges instead, uh, which ended up staying the same. Uh, so we had other ways to do it. Uh, I know we all, every, all of us know we need more, more money for transportation, but it's how you get there. I think the Republican plan of capturing existing sales taxes with a $19 billion surplus uh, would have been better for our Minnesotans. Um, a couple other things that I'm concerned about are the leakages. $87 million are going to be paid for for buildings from the trunk highway bonds. Uh, we've paid for that building once and now we're spending more money on it. We did reach some compromise, so I want to thank Senator Dibble for that. We've split that up 75% and 25%, so there was some compromise there. But I know, uh, standing up for Senator Newman, who's always talked about leakages, uh, that I can't uh, not talk about that. Uh, I've also voiced some concern about greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the commission and what that will do. Uh, again, I've talked to Senator Dibble about this, have some concerns. Uh, for example, will a, would, would another Highway 14 project get approved if it would have to go through the, this uh, commission? Uh, we've talked about the difference between emissions and safety or deaths versus emissions. And that's something that Senator Dibble has said we will talk about in the interim to try and make sure that this does not have a negative impact on some of our, our roads uh, or, or projects. Uh, we didn't see any increase in electric surcharge on, uh, or, uh, surcharge on electric vehicles. It stayed at $75, and we saw increases uh, for the non-electric for all kinds of gas tax, tab fees, uh, things like that. Uh, so I think that's still low, and we need to look at that. There was a, a, a committee that's going to be put together to look at those, so I do appreciate that, but uh, still concerned uh, they're not paying uh, what they should. Uh, they, just because they're electric, they don't do any less damage to our roads, so we need to make sure that that is uh, even for them as well. Uh, have some concern over the $195 million spent for the Northern Lights Express. Uh, we've seen ridership in, in the COVID and what's going on. We don't really have a true uh, picture of what that looks like, and, and, we're, and we're spending $195 million on that. So those are some of the concerns, again. Uh, $3.77 billion increase when we're increasing so many other areas of our government. Uh, as I've talked before on state government, that's increasing by 39.7%. We're increasing more taxes here. It's going to affect everything uh, down the road. So uh, in all the costs that we talk about inflation and all these increases are going to just continue to make inflation worse because we're increasing the fees that will be passed down to Minnesota residents. I do want to say a couple good things that I'm happy about. Uh, we did get some dedicated funding for small cities and townships that I want to thank Senator Dibble for including some of my language that Senator Howe and myself have been working on. That is good for our small cities and our townships. So they are receiving more money. Uh, very glad that's ongoing. Uh, that's something they desperately need. 
Uh, quarters of commerce, some changes there. We can always use more money for that, uh, which is important. Uh, Senator Dibble always talks about not liking earmarks, and he didn't like them, but I'm going to talk about a few, so we must have talked him into it. Senator Newman and I must have talked him in over time because there are quite a few. So, uh, And every time that we brought it up, as when we were in the majority, he was against them, and now they're in there. Uh, so he must have listened to us, I guess. So. <laughs> Uh, deputy registers, uh, that's been a big thing. We, we did an independent expert review on that. Uh, lots of things came out of that report. Uh, one of them was fee sharing uh, came out of the report, and that's the way I wanted to increase the money for the deputy registers because, as you've heard from even Senator Dibble himself, a lot of the work has been shifted to our deputy registers to do much more work on the front end when the back office has to do less, but they can't charge any more. So we had a plan that came up in the expert uh, review of how to do that with a fee, sh a fee sharing. Uh, this bill did not have fee sharing. It actually adds a convenience fee or some type of fee for the deputy registers uh, to increase. So that will help them. I'm happy about that. Uh, but I think it could have came a different way uh, through fee sharing because they are doing much more work. Uh, I wish the deputy registers would have got this sooner. Uh, and in the beginning of our negotiations, we had looked at $20 million of one-time money up front uh, to get some immediate money back to them. Uh, and I think we got beat up by the other body, uh, because I know Senator Dibble was in favor of that as well. And that got uh, reduced to $6 million one time. So uh, that got reduced uh, by quite a bit. And it's unfortunate, because uh, these deputy registers are not only small businesses, there are local cities and counties. Uh, we've seen, uh, I think, two more close already this year because it's becoming uh, not functional or financially feasible for them to, to stay operating because of the reduced or the, the fees and the non-fee sharing. So uh, that's some concern. But uh, overall, I'm, I'm happy the deputy register will be getting some relief. I'm also thankful uh, to Senator Dibble for uh, in including the State Patrol aircraft. Uh, in this bill, we'll have uh, funding for a new helicopter, and we're replacing two older uh, airplanes that have a lot of maintenance uh, and reliability issues with one new aircraft. So we're reducing the number of aircraft down by being more efficient uh, because those aircraft are aging. And the helicopter will be much more safe because it's a twin engine versus a single engine. It will actually have a hook and we can use it for a mu much more uh, multi-purpose uh, use for that. So again, I want to thank Senator Dibble for including that. It was one of my things I worked hard on. Um, uh, earmarks, again, I want to talk about a few earmarks. And again, these are something that uh, Senator uh, Newman and myself always refer to as constituent request instead of earmarks. And either way you want to talk about it, there are some included in this bill. Uh, so I want to thank Senator Dibble for doing that. Uh, highway 65 in Anoka County, Senator Kroon. Uh, U.S. Highway 10 in Coon Rapids, which affects Senator Hoffman, Senator Abler, and Senator Barr for $30 million. Uh, Trunk Highway 61 in Two Harbors, Senator Hothschild, $11 million. Uh, U.S. Highway 169 Interchange in Scott County, Senator Pratt. Uh, Trunk Highway 3 Roundabout in Rosemont, Senator May Quaid. And then an important highway, U.S. Highway 8 in Chisago County, uh, Senator Coran. Uh, that got uh, $42 million in there. So there's many others, but these are the big ones. Uh, we all know some of these roads are not safe. Uh, so getting funding for these roads are, are very important. Um, I'm not going to make a motion to re-refer this back to conference committee purposely because Senator Dibble did run and Senator uh, Representative Hornstein did run a good conference committee. Uh, we went through, had many meetings. Uh, they included me in the majority of them, not all of them, uh, but uh, most of them I felt that I had input. I felt our caucus had input. Uh, we didn't get everything we wanted by any means, uh, and we did not like the fee increases, uh, but I, I think the process worked the way it should, uh, so I don't want to take anyone's extra time and re-refer it and go back. Um, this is a bill that, again, uh, I'm concerned about the increases uh, because of what's happening in Minnesota right now with all the other committees and all the other increases we're seeing across the state with the $19 billion surplus uh, and, in, and continuing to increase taxes in Minnesota is uh, our, our frustration. Uh, unfortunately, because of those fee increases, I will not be able uh, to vote in favor of the bill. Uh, but folks, there are some good things. There was some compromise reached. So again, I want to thank Senator Dibble, our entire committee, uh, staff, both uh, partisan and nonpartisan, uh, for a good process. So thank you, members. Senator Kroon. 
Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I rise to talk about the favorite thing that I like to talk about in this chamber, Highway 65. Um, and I promise not to speak quite as long as I did the last time I spoke about it when um, getting the amendment on in the Senate version uh, for funding for Highway 65. But if you'll indulge, indulge me for a moment, Mr. President, this is a really, really big deal for our community in Blaine. Um, I very much appreciate the historic funding this bill provides to Blaine and the entire North Metro. Um, and because this was truly a, a bipartisan, all hands on deck effort over many, many years to get it to this point, um, there are a lot of thank yous to go around. And so um, first and foremost, I'd like to thank Senator Jasinski um, for his uh, guidance and advocacy on this and our Republican researcher, Dave Frazier, who I'm sure is very sick and tired of me talking about Highway 65 over and over and asking a million questions, but thank you. Um, Senator Hoffman and Abler, Representative West, Representative Newton, Representative Cagle, all of who have been working on this issue for a very, very long time are very knowledgeable and have advocated uh, effectively uh, for this project. Representative Norris, uh, the mayor of Blaine, Tim Sanders, all the city council members in Blaine, particularly Jess Robertson, who's um, been a bulldog for this project over many years, um, all the Anoka County commissioners, particularly Julie Jepson and Julie Brasted, who've worked tirelessly for this, um, the Blaine engineer, the Anoka County engineer, all the countless number of staff and city who have gotten this project to this point where the funding was possible. And uh, finally, Mr. President, I'd like to thank Senator Dibble for uh, keeping this important project in the bill, even though I know he doesn't like earmarks and I'm not in his party. Um, thank you for listening to me talk about Highway 65 over and over and uh, allowing me to advocate for my community through this, throughout this session. And uh, thank you, most importantly, for keeping uh, my earmark amendment in the bill uh, through the conference committee. I truly appreciate your interest in this project and your desire to fund a well-deserving project on the merits and to genuinely help the people in the North Metro. And Mr. President, that's what this is about. It's about improving the lives of the tens of thousands of people uh, who ride on Highway 65 every single day. And Mr. President, dollar for dollar, this funding will improve the quality of life uh, for the most people possible. And it will save lives, Mr. President. There's absolutely no doubt about that. So I'm incredibly and genuinely grateful for the inclusion of this funding. Mr. President, when I campaigned, I did make securing funding for Highway 65 my top priority uh, for my district. And, and I'm happy to be able to fulfill that priority, but I also promised the voters in my district um, emphatically that we could secure that necessary funding for Highway 65 without raising taxes. And I, I told my voters that if we properly prioritize roads and bridges and the primary functions of our state government in transportation, while utilizing our historic surplus, much of it which was one-time funding, there was plenty of money to fund critical infrastructure projects like Highway 65. And as we've heard, Mr. President, this bill has nearly uh, $4 billion in increased taxes and fees. Um, most problematic, in my view, is the metro sales tax of 0.75%, because when you combine that with the sales tax increase in the housing bill of 0.25%, the residents in my district are going to be saddled with a full 1% sales tax increase. And um, also the increase in the gas tax that will eventually, I understand, go up to five cents per gallon, the retail delivery fee, the motor vehicle reg uh, sales tax increase, and the motor vehicle registration tax increase. And most of these tax increases, as I understand the bill, are not going uh, to our biggest and most urgent transportation needs, roads and bridges. The residents in my district um, do not support the tax increases to fund things like light rail expansion, and particularly a new passenger train to Duluth. That's very unpopular in my district, Mr. President. Um, these are clearly wants, they're not needs. And they are items I specifically promised the voters in my district that I would not support. And, it, and it's been said that there is no surplus in transportation, and, and that is true. Um, and to fix that, Mr. President, I would absolutely support diverting more existing revenue sources to transportation. 
um, including existing sales tax uh, revenue and general fund dollars to go to these critical infrastructure projects, these roads and bridges that desperately do need more revenue and attention. Um, but Mr. President, I don't support creating new revenue sources in the form of these tax and fee increases. So as excited as I am about this bill, I can't support the tax and fee increases that are contained therein, Mr. President, but I did feel it was very important for me to stand up and um, talk about this project and to thank the people that I did. So thank you, Mr. President. The Secretary would take the role on the motion to adopt the committee report. Members, please vote. Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Pa votes aye. And Senator Pa votes aye. Senator Zizinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Uh, Senator Lang votes no. Senator Lang votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Cronin, are you voting? Mr. President. Senator Jasinski. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. All senators having voted who desires to vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 34 ayes and 31 nays, the motion to adopt the committee report prevails. The secretary will give the bill its third reading. House file number 2887, a bill for an act relating to transportation, establishing a budget for transportation, appropriating money for transportation purposes, et cetera. Third reading, any discussion on the bill? Senator uh, Grutenhagen. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, I just, uh, I guess I got to stand up for my low income people, uh, not only in my district, but actually across the state. And, uh, you know, the $3.77 billion tax increase in fees in here is just uh, unacceptable. You know, the other thing about a gas tax increase, uh, it's regressive. Why? Because it hits the low income and the poor the most. As you increase the gas tax, uh, uh, the total gas tax, you increase the price of almost all, if not all, goods and services. And that makes it more difficult for the low income and poor. You know, you add that to all the other tax increases we had it, it, here in the state, 
plus the 18% uh, inflation rate that we're suffering under the Biden administration, and we're crushing the poor. I mean, it just, you know, with a 19 billion, almost $19 billion surplus, and we can't find the money to fund transportation, and I agree, transportation is uh, very important, and I appreciate uh, Senator Dibble's uh, commitment to it. Sounds like I wasn't on the committee, but it sounds like you ran a very open and transparent committee. Uh, the other thing, uh, members, we just simply have to prioritize our spending rather than continue to raise taxes on the hardworking people of the state of Minnesota. It just, I mean, there's just no end to it. We're growing the general fund budget, the last information I got, from $52 billion to $72 billion, almost a 40% increase. And the private sector is not getting those types of increases, and they pay the bills. This is simply unsustainable. And then you add to that uh, some of the projects in here, which is uh, light rail. And uh, light rail is not flexible. We live in a dynamic economy. We need flexibility. And we're, we're promoting 19th century technology with Southwest Light Rail, some of the other light rails. In fact, we're prioritizing the um, uh, driving in the metro area for light rail. And, uh, you know, and then it, once it's built, it still has to be subsidized millions of dollars a year. And we don't enforce fees, and there's lots of crime and problems with it, and yet we continue to blindly go down this road. It just is hard for me to understand. Again, I, I support buses. Buses are flexible. You can move them around based on, uh, on the, on the uh, demographic growth in a city and also the business growth, but light rail isn't. You've got to move everything to it. That's why it's such a boondoggle. And then when we look at Southwest Light Rail, the costs have skyrocketed, and uh, it's just been a disaster in so many ways, and yet we just close our eyes and go right down that path. So members, I can't, I appreciate uh, Senator Dibble's efforts on this. Uh, Court of Commerce view, you know, there's some good things in here, but the overall bill uh, should have been funded with existing tax revenues, not another almost $4 billion of taxes. I can't go back in good faith to the people of my district and say that when we had a $19 billion surplus, we're raising taxes and fees another nine to $10 billion. That's ridiculous, members. Thank Senator you, Hoffman, Mr. oh, I'm sorry. Senator Hoffman. Thank you, Mr. President. And I, I rise in full support. This is absolutely amazing on two things. I'm gonna tell you the year, Mr. President, 1988. It wasn't the year that a member from Minnesota got a Grammy nomination. That was 1994. But in 1988, a letter was sent by some small business owners from Ramsey, Minnesota, and it was all about this Highway 10, the connection between Highway 10 across the North Metro and how important that thoroughfare has been and it, and it is. But in 1988, this letter showed about the need because of the amount of miles, vehicle miles traveled and the amount of, of traffic that's on Highway 10. And finally, Senator Dibble, thank you. And, um, for finally finishing this project that started in 1988. The third lane uh, in Coon Rapids in Anoka County is gonna finish that. This is important because it's the most traveled road there is. There are some other projects. There's one road, Mr. President, there are over 7,000 students a day that travel along 109th and 169. 7,000 students a day in one cluster of Anoka Hennepin School Districts, which, by the way, Mr. President, is the largest school district in the state of Minnesota, but these 7,000 students just in one little cluster of Champlain Brooklyn Park, that roadway, 109th, there's a huge development. This absolutely is a safety issue. It's also as well as opening up the thoroughfare. So, Mr. President, uh, those and some other projects, I am absolutely delighted to vote green on this. And thank you, Senator Dibble, for being remained accessible to all of us who care about a letter from 1988. Thank you. The ranking member, Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Again, I just want to thank uh, Senator Dibble. Um, this is the way a committee should run. 
Uh, I know many of us are many fond memories of Senator Tomasoni, and Senator Tomasoni would be proud today to watch the way we ran our committee with the respect, even though we don't agree on certain things, we had the respect. So thanks, Senator Dibble. The only other item that I was a little bit frustrated that I forgot to talk about that we did not get included that the House took out, the other body took out, was the Senator Scott Newman Scenic Highway. But I, they, I know you stood firm on it, but they, they did ask that one to be taken out, and I would have liked to have seen that in, but I, I will continue to try and get that in the bill sooner or later one day, as long as it's the scenic byway, not Memorial Highway. So uh, th again, thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, this is the way a committee should run. I wish more committees ran this way. Uh, so thanks again to Senator Dibble and his staff. Uh, thank you very much. Members, we usually don't let the other, uh, any other member speak before the ranking member, but Senator House says that he tried to make co eye contact and I didn't see it. And even though I have glasses, I really tried to make an effort to see. But briefly, Senator Howe, before we then go to the author of the bill, Senator Howe, and, and our apologies, uh, Senator Jasinski, because we don't like to do that. I apologize to Senator Maj uh, I apologize to Senator Jasinski for, uh, for speaking after him. And uh, I appreciate, the, Mr. President, you let me do this because uh, having been on the uh, Transportation Committee my entire legislative career and uh, having worked on the automotive parts sales tax uh, for seven of those years, uh, I, uh, I greatly appreciate uh, how Senator Dibble ran that committee. I appreciate that that is finally included. Uh, it's, uh, now I can uh, look at selling that Suburban that actually instigated the whole process. Uh, but I am disappointed that it does not come into effect until quite late down the road. But I, uh, it comes into effect, but it doesn't give us the full 100%. Uh, but there are the things that I appreciate being in the uh, in the bill that are overlooked by many folks, but allowing uh, discounts and allowing those folks that are 100% disabled veterans to not have to pay fees, I think is a huge thing for many of our veterans that uh, have served so well, making it easier to uh, get driver's license uh, designated get veteran designation on your driver's license. We can now use other documents other than your NGB 22 or your DD 214. You can use your, your, your uh, ID card, your, right, your retired ID card. You can use your VA health card, making it much more easier for folks to come in and get that veteran designation on their driver's license. Now, the other things I'm, I'm not so, uh, that leaves me concerned with this bill is the Northern Lights train funding, the additional funding for light rail, not addressing the lack of uh, EVs paying their fair share for road maintenance. I do believe the, we had some alternatives there we could have looked at that would have made that much more, much more fair in what we're doing, but yet we're increasing the gas tax on other vehicles. I don't think that's, you know, with, we could have at least raised the registration fee, which I'm not a fan of uh, the cost of what we're doing with registration fees the way it is. Uh, I think they're far too high in this state, and we should be raising revenue more for the people that pass through here and do damage to our roads, much more than we're doing with those folks uh, from Minnesotans. But with that, members, uh, I do appreciate the dialogue and the input that we had. Uh, I'm disappointed that it came back, in my view, much worse than it did when it left. And for that fact, for those reasons, I'll have to vote against it. But I do want to thank Senator Dibble and staff for the, uh, for the open dialogue and the method that it was determined in. Thank you, Mr. President. The author of, Sen of House File 2887, Senator Dibble. Before well, we thank vote. you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. President, members, uh, no matter how you're voting on this bill, um, I do believe 
that at some point in the not too distant future, um, and in the distant future when you're, you've got your grandkids on your knee and you see that uh, Minnesota has great roads that are in good repair, that has transit that serves everyone, gets them to what they need, uh, that we've uh, turned around the climate crisis and this bill was a big part of it. And you were here, uh, and even though some of you are voting no, you contributed to this bill and made it better uh, and you'll be very, very proud of the work we're doing here today. We inherited a Minnesota that is great, uh, that was invested in by those who preceded us. Uh, they built this fourth largest roadway system in the country, and I often say not fourth largest per capita, the fourth largest number of roadway miles in the country, and that is a big part of why Minnesota is a successful place a big part of why we have an economy that works, because people and goods can get where they need to go. And we now inherit that system, and it is our opportunity to then invest in our lives and the lives of those who are going to follow us. And that means we invest in the kind of transportation that serves everyone, everywhere, does not isolate communities, lets us get a handle on the existential crisis of climate, uh, stabilizes uh, and, and moves us forward finally after so many years of trying uh, transit and, and, uh, and uh, non-motorized transportation uh, in the metro area and across the state of Minnesota, uh, something that has been a, a dream for, for decades and we're finally going to do that with this bill. It's a very, very exciting generational opportunity uh, and it finishes the work that we started uh, 10 years ago uh, with the leadership of, of Margaret Anderson Kelleher in the Senate, my good friend Frank Hornstein and I have been working on these issues uh, together. Even long, I don't know if people know that we've been working on these issues since long before we together since long before we even came to the state legislature. So it's an extremely proud moment uh, to be passing this bill and having him be my legislative partner in the other chamber. Just want to also quickly uh, get to my thank yous, Mr. President. Um, our our conference committee, who I mentioned earlier uh, on the House side, uh, Representative Tabke, Cagle. Brand and Petersburg were, were awesome, and they have a passion and a heart for this work. And of course, you know my dear friend uh, Senator Dzinski, with whom I very, very, very much enjoy working. Uh, we uh, we spar uh, and we debate, um, but the bill always ends up better uh, for that debate. Uh, and of course, uh, Senator Morrison, McEwen, and Carlson, uh, who you heard from earlier, the passion and the issues that they brought to the bill and are major uh, parts and aspects and chapters of this bill. And then on the, on the Transportation Committee, Senator Lang and Coleman and Howe, um, just uh, I couldn't ask for uh, better members from the other party, and of course, Senator, pa uh, Senator Port and Senator Herr, uh, my colleagues from the DFL caucus who serve as well and bring a lot of excellent, excellent uh, intelligence to this work. And uh, Tim Greenfield, uh, Senate Counsel, Crystal Boyd, uh, our fiscal analyst uh, who are sitting right behind me. Um, I said it last night, I'll say it again. Uh, I just can't even conceive how they do the amazing work they do on the timelines that they're given. Um, it's truly, truly awesome and incredible. Uh, and really, this bill is theirs. They wrote it. <laughs> we, t we take all this credit, but they wrote it. It's their bill. And uh, Lexi Stengel, who, uh, who preceded uh, Mr. Greenfield, a uh, big, big part of our work in the past. And of course, couldn't, can't not mention Bonnie Berzowski, who's uh, been building towards this, helping us build towards this day as well in years past. Uh, Nate Pasco, our, our um, partisan researcher, uh, writes these bill briefs, even though we uh, only give them uh, less than a few hours to, to write them and helps us do all that research. Beth Ethier, the, our, my awesome and amazing committee administrator, Alex Will, uh, committee legislative assistant, uh, my trusty staff who's with me every step of the way, taking care of me, taking care of every detail. Um, and uh, Dave Frazier up at the table, um, very creative and, and uh, a hard worker and, and a researcher, um, plants all those good ideas on Senator Jasinski and Dom Linetti, who uh, supports him, uh, 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 Jess Yagane and uh, Mark Kimball, who help us uh, communicate effectively to the wide world around us, uh, and the awesome uh, committee pages, uh, Andrew George and Sam Schockman, uh, who set up the room and break it down and hand out all the amendments and just do a, a, a lot of work and do a really, really fantastic job. So members, thank you very much. Um, when you cast your green vote or your red vote, um, just know that you're, pa you're, you're part of something that is really, really historic and really generational. I urge a green vote and thank you all very much. Have a good day. The secretary would take roll on final passage of House File 2887 as amended by the conference committee. Members, please vote.
Senator Bowden, for those voting under Rule 40.7. Thank you, Mr. President. I report that Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Herr votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Mann votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. Senator Port votes aye. And Senator Pa votes aye. And Senator Pa votes aye. Members, please vote. Senator Jasinski, for those voting under Rule 40.7, when you're ready. Senator Jasinski. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Duckworth votes no. Senator Duckworth votes no. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Lang votes no. And Senator Lang votes no. Senator Jasinski for Senator Barr. Thank you, Mr. President. Senator Barr votes no. Senator Barr votes no. Mr. President. Senator uh, uh, Jasinski. I have one correction. Okay. Senator Coleman votes no. Senator Coleman votes no. Or not a correction, I forgot one, sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. All senators having voted who desires a vote, the secretary will close the roll. There being 34 ayes and 32 noes, the bill is passed and is title agreed to as amended by the conference committee. <laughs> Members, we will now proceed to the 13th order of business. Any announcements of Senate interests? Any announcements of Senate interests? Without objection, the following senators will be excused from today's session. Miller from 12 noon to 12.20 p.m. Pratt from 6.20 p.m. until the end. Any additional announcements of Senate interest? Senator Johnson. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I assume that we're going to be adjourning here in a minute, uh, but when we do that, Senate Republicans, we're going to be caucusing up in 323. Members, I would just want to make sure that others were able to hear. Could you keep the noise down, please? Senator Johnson, you want to repeat your announcement because I'm not sure, sure many could hear it. So we're, Senate Republicans, we're going to caucus 323 uh, pro after adjournment. Senator Desig, for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, it's still light out, so thank you for all, everybody. Um, we are adjourning till tomorrow, and then we'll take up the HHS bill. Uh, so, Mr. President, I move that the Senate do now adjourn until tomorrow, Monday, May 22nd, at 10.30 a.m. To that motion, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. All opposed say no. The motion passes, and the Senate is now adjourned until Monday, May 22nd.